Rainbow Push, Push Tech 2023. It's now my pleasure to introduce our first panel of the day, Diversity, Inclusion, and Equity, Where Are We Now? And I'd like to bring to our stage the, our moderator who's going to introduce the panelists. Rachel Williams is my good, dear friend and colleague. Rachel is Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at The Motley Fool. Please put your hands together to welcome Rachel. Hi. Are these my notes? I think so. OK. Um, All right. I, I, just work, I just work here. I don't know. <laughs> Thought you might know a little more than that, friend. Good morning, everybody. I am super excited to be here and excited to bring up this panel to have a really rich discussion about all the things that my good friend Brian just shared about what's been going on in, with diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the tech industry probably over the last 10 or so years. So to help me have that discussion, I'm going to be looking for my friend Janae Ingram, who is the Director, Community Partner and Programs at Airbnb. <laughs> Give her a big round of applause. Hi. Hello. I'd also like to bring up uh, Rushika Hodel, mm -hmm. who is Director of Strategy, Programming, and Policy Lead on Civil Rights, so this is important, yeah. at Meta. Where is Rushika? Uh-oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> we didn't start it. All right. <laughs> We're going to wait for her to get all prettied up. I saw her earlier. She's fine. Um, is Laura going to be joining us via satellite or via Zoom? Does anybody know? Anyone? Okay, thanks. Well, we are getting started ahead of a everybody else's schedule, it looks like, my friend. Slightly, slightly early. That's not a, a bad thing. That's not a, I know. Look at us. Progress. Exactly. Already. <laughs> All right. Well, in the meantime, do you want to share with everybody a little bit about your background? Sure. Um, and so for anyone who was here last night, um, <laughs> forgive, forgive the repeat, but it's great to be with you all. And good morning. I hope everyone has had a wonderful night. Um, I'm Janae Ingram. I am, have been with Airbnb for six years. Um, I know. It's been six years. Six years. Tell me about it. We, we spoke when I was like <laughs> newly minted and now six mm. years later. Um, <laughs> I am in a position called uh, Director of Community Partner Programs and Engagement. And I sit within our stakeholder initiatives team. Um, I know we're planning to talk a little bit about shareholders and, and Airbnb views things a little bit differently in that we have five stakeholder groups um, inclusive of our shareholders, but also our employees, which is not necessarily that different, but because Airbnb is a business that's powered by our hosts and guests, yeah. um, it's the host and guest community as well as external communities. Hi, how Hi. are you? Hi. No worries. No, no worries. <laughs> we'll wait. We were just, we were just <laughs> chit-chatting. <laughs> All right, you can continue on and then we'll get to Rashika. Yeah, so um, we, um, I don't know if everyone heard me, but we have our hosts and guests as well as communities, both place-based communities and then identity communities. Um, because we recognize, one, we would not have a business if it were not for people opening up their homes and sharing them with others. We wouldn't have a business if those hosts opened up their homes and no one came. So that's why the guests are important. Such a wild idea. I know. To think about. It, it is. Now, and right? yet, Open like, now we're a verb. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. you're, you're going to Airbnb, Airbnb your house. <laughs> um, and then the communities, because we are a place-based business. Um, and we recognize that people are staying in communities around the world. Yep. Um, and when they're staying, they are bringing their whole identity. So it's, it's a multi-pronged way of looking at community. I love that. I love that. Thanks. No problem. Hi, Fran. Hi. <laughs> My voice introduce... is a little bit rough today, but that's here, here I am. That's okay. We'll take it deep. <laughs> We're going to go deep today. Okay. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Rochika Hotel. I work at Meta. I'm on the civil rights team at the company. Um, the, com the, the team has been around for a little over two years. I have been there uh, a little bit longer. I've been there for six years, always working on civil rights issues, con um, specifically content policy issues. So what is and isn't allowed on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, but, but as of two and a half years ago, with the backing of a team, a VP, Roy Austin, who's my boss, funding, su support from leadership. So a 
a really different situation than, than it was when I first started at the company. And a lot of that is a result of the civil rights audit that we undertook after Airbnb did theirs, um, also with Laura Murphy. Nice. I'm hoping Laura's going to be able to join us at some point during okay. our discussion. She may or may not. <laughs> we'll see. It'll oh, just, there she is. Be, all right. All right. Ask and ye shall receive. <laughs> Hi, Laura. Good to see you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So, Laura, we are just doing introductions, and you popped up at the appropriate time. You want to share okay. your name, who you are, what you do with the wonderful folks here? Yes, I am president of Laura Murphy and Associates, and I um, I started my firm in 2005, but uh, I've worked for elected officials, and uh, for the ACLU, I ran the lobbying operation for almost 20 years, and I pioneered the use of civil rights audits for corporations to assess their policies, practices, products, and services uh, to see whether or not they have a discriminatory impact. And the two audits that I'm known for are Airbnb and Facebook. And I've had the great pleasure of working with Janae in her capacity as a civil rights leader and um, with Ruchika in, during the Facebook uh, audit. Uh, she was instrumental in making sure the company paid attention to the audit and help us helping the auditors navigate the company and she's playing an extraordinary leadership role um, in Facebook with regard to the implementation of the audit recommendations working in the civil newly created civil rights division so I'm excited to be here and I send my best wishes to Pastor Bryant uh, to Butch Wing, to Reverend Jackson, and I also want to congratulate Janae for being the recipient of this year's Push Tech 2023 award. Yes, Thank round you. of applause for that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Laura. I gave you lots of shout outs last night. Laura <laughs> is responsible for me being at Airbnb. So Wow, okay. All right. Great debt. <laughs> that is awesome. So, you know, I'm a chief diversity officer and I know how these conversations go internally. So how do the two of you manage to get a civil rights audit pushed through and done? Did you no, wanna go? No, please go ahead. So I will say the civil rights audit at Airbnb preceded me. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, back in 2016, um, Airbnb at the time was a fairly young company. Um, there had been issues of discrimination that had been reported, but I think people thought at the time that it was sort of a one-off, that someone dealing with discrimination here and there, it wasn't as widespread. Right, systemic. And it wasn't systemic, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2016, the hashtag Airbnb while black oh, yeah. catapulted to it with on, it within social media. Mm -hmm. And I think our company said, oh my gosh, we actually have, Thanks. this is a widespread problem. This is not a one-off here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time they contacted Laura. So I really feel like this is a, a great question for her to <laughs> jump in on, but they yeah. contacted Laura and Laura really, as she said, pioneered this new thing of, a, of an audit yeah. of the company. <laughs> so I, Laura, I, I guess I should turn yeah. it to you and you can talk about all of the amazing things that you did within the company at that time. Well, uh, first of all, the uh, idea of doing a more comprehensive approach to a company, not just looking at diversity, equity, and inclusion, I have to give credit to Reverend Jackson, because Reverend Jackson talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but he also talked about uh, diversity on the board, uh, contracting opportunities. So when I approached Airbnb, it was from the background of a civil rights advocate and, and working with all of these fantastic civil rights leaders. Um, the first thing I did was interview them about what their concerns were about Airbnb. Because I think stakeholder input is crucial to a company reforming its practices. And so... Um, I never thought that the hashtag Airbnb while black had 
only to do with the hosts who were on the Airbnb platform rejecting black guests. I, I thought it may have to do with corporate culture as well. And what I discovered was there weren't enough people of color in leadership positions. There weren't adequate contracting opportunities. There weren't strong anti-discrimination policies. There wasn't a way to measure discrimination. And so in that initial report in 2016, I made recommendations that went far beyond the guest experience, the black guest experience, but in more deeply the corporate culture. And as I said, this is something that came out of conversations with many civil rights leaders. During that report, we held meetings with civil rights stakeholders and we got feedback. And so that I would, you know, maybe I pioneered how to put it in all in a report, but I certainly didn't pioneer the elements of a civil rights audit which came out of a variety of, of um, stakeholder and, and user concerns. So during the course of that audit, I uh, interviewed um, guests, black guests. I interviewed hosts. I interviewed the um, black employee groups, Hispanic employee groups. And I, what I found was there were similar problems affecting Asian users, Latinx users, and so really what started out as a racial justice issue was more broadly um, a concern of um, people with disabilities, for example, who didn't feel like they could access the platform equally or fairly and felt that they faced discrimination. So this was really an organic process. And the civil rights groups liked it. And they liked the outcomes. They liked their interaction with Airbnb leaders. And I have to give credit to Airbnb leaders who I think embody a philosophy of inclusion and also social responsibility. So they were anxious to fix this problem. So this wasn't something that I had to foist on them. They were receptive. And so because of that Airbnb experience, when Facebook started to have its issues and concerns it, um, the civil rights groups recommended that I conduct the Facebook civil rights audit, and I'll throw it over to Rusha for uh, yeah. how that all got started. Yeah, okay. Um, this is so fun because I, you know, you read about things or I might see you speak, I might see you speak, but it's fun to be on the same panel because we're very different products. We offer very different products and services, but it sounds like you know, a lot of similarities um, where I talked about how a lot of it was very organic. And I guess it helps that we have the same person um, conducting, overseeing <laughs> our audit. But, um, but, but it does seem like there's some core components and elements that are, that are similar across both, about, across both audits. Um, the way ours came to be, I, I think actually similar, <laughs> again, to what Janae said. I was at the company, but... Um, the issues that would come up, you know, if it was a content policy issue, somebody posted something drawing attention to racism and discrimination, they had been called something awful, we took it down. And so we would look at these issues one by one by one, and we, we didn't really look look at the, the system holistically. And our and our technology was much more nascent. Um, the, the, you know, video was only introduced to Facebook in 2014, so all of this was was still new at the time that the calls for the audit were starting. Um, but but it was that it was that we we were looking at things in a one-off way, and civil rights groups were urging us to look more broadly. And we actually made some really um, amazing hires at the company. So one of my colleagues is in the audience, Amrita. She's on the external affairs team at at Meta, and that team. Um, has a that, that has a center. There, there's a center left focus, and um, and some of the early hires on that team are um, Monique Dorsonville and Lindsay Elin, who come from the civil rights community, and they really, you know, they had seen um, some of these things work in not in corporate America, and and, and they wanted to bring, um, you know, bring their network in, bring some of the lessons learned in, and so they. 
I think were hearing the demands, but they also had these new and exciting ideas that they wanted to push leadership on, and they did. And um, I think it was actually May 2018, Mark Zuckerberg got asked a question by Cory Booker when he was testifying. Um, and so maybe I think Cory Booker thinks that he convinced us to do the civil rights audit, which is very fair. Yeah, let's, give but him, it was, let's give him that. Okay. You know? <laughs> but, I, but I think it was a conversation that had started, and I'm so glad, um, I'm so glad we did it. We we're a stronger company yeah. for having done it. We certainly still have a lot of room for improvement, um, a lot of very fair, constructive criticism that comes our way. But um, I, I love the work that I get to do every day and, and really... The audit that we did with Laura was like one of the the biggest achievements and things that I'm most proud of in, in my oh, career. I love that. And I actually feel so much better hearing what's happening at your companies using your products now, to be honest. Really. Yeah. Like I was gonna use Airbnb anyway, and I <laughs> and I keep up with my family on Facebook, so there's that. Um, but it, it warms my heart to know that something is happening on the inside um, in a real way to bring about real change. Um, Laura, I've got a question for you, friend. After the murder of George Floyd, which we're approaching the, I don't even want to say the word anniversary. It's not a celebratory situation. But the third year post um, that tragedy, did you get a lot of phone calls? I did. I did. I got overwhelmed with phone calls from corporations who wanted to do something, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I said no to all of them, and instead, I wrote a report um, called the key, the rationale for and key elements of a civil, a business civil rights audit. So I wrote a guidebook um, about what, what is the, the business rationale for doing an audit? Mm -hmm. What were the outcomes of the Airbnb, Facebook, and Starbucks audits? I did not do Starbucks. Eric Holder did that. Um, and you know, how do you how do you go about conducting these audits? So I wanted to leave a trail of breadcrumbs. I was afraid that if I started into you know getting sucked into individual corporations, then mm -hmm. I I would not be able to get the um the report out there, which is basically a how-to, and it's for executives to understand what is this civil rights audit thing? Why is it important? Why should my company do it? And I spent a lot of time talking about how the workforce is changing, how the customer base is changing, how we're becoming a minority majority country in a, very, in, in a few short decades. And we are, um, uh, corporations need to be attentive to their workforce and their customers concerns, and you're going to lose a lot of talent if you don't address discrimination issues. And it's the right thing to do, by the way. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> I decided that the rest of my career would be spent advising, uh, you know, uh, these policy areas about the corporate uh, civil rights audits and, and laying the groundwork. And now I'm working with a team are coming up with standards to evaluate uh, audits um, and to train auditors so that this thing, as it multiplies, now some 30 corporations have agreed to conduct racial equity or civil rights audits. Can we just so stop and clap for that, take, please? Taken Thank off. You. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the breadcrumbs. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm just trying to create the standards so that because we are seeing fake audits come out, we are seeing meaningless yeah. mm -hmm. uh, assessments coming out. And I'm not going to tell you which ones are which. I'm going to leave that to the audience to discern. But uh, come on, I really Laura. want the hard hitting, <laughs> in depth audits to take place. So I, I took a long answer, but I'm sorry. But I love a long answer you, that, that um, you just gave because to hear that you turned down some folks and you laid a foundation and a legacy. So there's no excuse for any company, in my opinion, to not have information that's out there on, on uh, the interwebs or internets 
to find out what is a civil rights audit. So they, their information is out there for CEOs, Correct. chief diversity officers, um, ESG, whatever we want to call ourselves now. I think it's all being couched under different names now. Um, right? <laughs> <laughs> and there it is there in all it of is. its beauty and glory right there. So um, is it on your website, though, just to kind of give it's on It's on my website, but it's also on uh, the leadership conference on civil and human rights websites. But if you just type in the rationale for and key elements of a business civil rights audit, you will find it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So we audit is done. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about implementation. That's a, that's a lot to cover all of those stakeholders. How did you all decide who to start and where to start? Within the implementation? Mm -hmm. um, so I think shortly after the team um, convened or brought Laura in and our, our leadership brought Laura in, we had um, a cross-functional group that was called the Anti-Discrimination Task Force. Um, and it was comprised of lots of leaders from throughout the company. Um, that sort of evolved over the years. Obviously, we went from a place of, you know, sort of triage, in, in other, you know, in, in essence, um, trying to understand and figure out how to address this issue. And through Laura's report, we, we made progress. We put in place several things. Um, including a community commitment, which um, has a modal blocker. So for those of you who are not technical in the room, a modal blocker is a pop-up on your window, and it basically stops you from moving forward in the, in the platform until you accept mm -hmm. and make a commitment that you will not discriminate against anyone else in the community under a whole host of protected categories. We need modal blockers all yes, over the place. We girl. do, like, we do. <laughs> it, it, it literally stops you in your track. And, and what I, I will that. say is, um, this was a huge commitment, and Laura talks about this often, because we didn't test it. Our CEO said that he was gonna do this, and I'll let Laura tell you how she <laughs> reacted when he said this. Um, and to date, we have removed 2.5 million people from our platform Woo! because they would not agree to that. Yes, so yes. So that was a really important one. Um, we did a, a whole host of other things, created a policy called Open Doors, which allows yeah. anyone who will, who thinks that they're being discriminated against to report it immediately. That will allow our team to investigate. Um, so that was an important one. We created something called Instant Book, which allowed for you to book a place instantly without having the host need to see your, needing to see your profile or anything like that, that would give you the opportunity to sort of bypass any room for bias creep. We've evolved that um, now, and I can talk more about that. But another thing that we did, which was really key and crucial, was we created a, a team. At the time, they were called the Anti-Discrimination Product Team. Mm -hmm. um, we, again, for those of you who may not know tech, the <laughs> folks who get paid the most and who are the <laughs> most important to the business are the engineers, <laughs> the data scientists, yeah. the technical people. Yeah. We invested in a whole team of technical people whose job it was wow. to investigate, uncover, and help us come up with solutions mm -hmm. to address discrimination on the platform. Mm -hmm. That team um, has expanded and today is bigger than it was when we started this work. Um, and importantly, that team helped us create Project Lighthouse, which is, um, a tool that we have, and I talked about this last night, for those of you who are here, you'll hear it again. <laughs> it's good, it'll help you remember. Um, Project Lighthouse is a tool that we developed that helps us you understand um, the disparities that exist on the platform based on perceived race. Oh. And perceived race is important because when you are in the Airbnb platform, I don't know your race. I know what I perceive you to be. And that could mm. be right, that could be incorrect right. and how, from how you define what your racial identity is. Right. So we wanted to mimic that experience and understand the places in, that disparities were happening on the platform. And we spent years doing building this tool. We launched it in 2020. And just last year, at the end of last year, we came out with our report. It's our third report since Laura's original audit. Um, we did a, a three-year report 
in the midpoint. Um, but in the report, we talked about the fact that there is, unfortunately, a disparity between users of color mm -hmm. and white users. Mm -hmm. and, and while I will say, overall, the, the, the thing that we measured was called the booking success rate. Mm -hmm. So overall, most mm -hmm. people, they can, you know, book above 90%. 90, 90%. So everyone generally has a high percentage of booking. Um, but we know that users of color, people of color, um, or people who are perceived to be people of color um, have different experience. And mm -hmm. that allows us to um, basically take action and create solutions. Going back to your question, in the evolution of all of this work since 2016, the anti-discrimination task force has evolved, but we are still very cross-functional. The work exists and we have leaders, every leader within our company has a stake in this work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for us, that's an important um, game changer because the business itself is holistic and our approach to solutions needs to be holistic. Yeah. Um, so we have the buy-in and the participation of those leaders in advising us and working with us on the solutions um, and uh, essentially continuing the work. Our CEO has said that the anti-discrimination product team or our team that looks at discrimination is going to be in the company sort of in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. And so that type of commitment yeah. to addressing discrimination, which we know exists in the world, um, and we want to make sure in our community it doesn't exist. So we want to fight it. Amazing. I, just, I can listen to you talk about this all day. <laughs> Because I remember oh, when you. I started in this work, it was really just all about the demographics. Who are we hiring? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me, it, one of the things I would want to call out that the progress that's been made is that we are now impacting product, which means we're impacting the revenue yes. of the company as well. Rashika, tell, tell me your story. What's, how did you begin to think about implementing, I'm sure, all of the recommendations from Laura? Yeah, yeah. So um, Laura's audit resulted in, in three reports over the course of two plus years. Mm -hmm. And I think when we went back and organized, you know, all of the different action items and recommendations and then ran them by Laura and the civil rights law firm that partnered with Laura to oversee the audit, Realm and Colfax, we like line by line determined that there were 117 recommendations <laughs> and action items. Nice work, so, Laura. Um, <laughs> yeah. Two of them. Yeah, really, really holistic, um, hefty, hefty um, piece of work. So, um, and as Laura said, she talked to civil rights stakeholders to kind of organize the audit. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing, there were a lot of things that came up in the conversations. And our audit is organized um, in different chapters across those substantive areas. But I think the number one thing that came up was accountability. We, we're not going to be um, under an audit forever. Laura is going to go away and, you know, enjoy her life in some different capacity. And so what was the company going to do once the audit was over? What kind of accountability and infrastructure were we going to commit to to ensure that, one, there was implementation of the audit recommendations, but two, you know, like culturally, um, holistically, cross-functionally, how are we going to make sure that the, the work continues into perpetuity? So the, I think the biggest recommendation coming out of Laura's audit was build a civil rights team, commit to hiring a civil rights leader and empower that person to, to build a team. And our audit actually came out, you talked about the murder of George Floyd. Our audit came out two months after the murder of George mm -hmm. Floyd. And so there was, I mean, all of us remember this racial reckoning happening in this country. And it really felt to me like for the first time, maybe there was there, there was a lot of um, possibility for corporations to not just donate money. We have been doing that for years and years, but but like step up and and put our you know put actions behind the money. Yeah. And so um, so we were. You know, I, I don't even know how much of this is um, is out there in the public, but we were going back and forth with Laura on like, do we hire a civil rights director? And Laura was like, come on, people, look at the world around you. Like, that is not enough. Step up. That's right, Laura. Do more. And so <laughs> we, we committed to hiring a civil rights VP, which, um, you know, which is a, a C-suite level title. We committed to um, giving that VP, Roy Austin, 
the ability to hire a team. And in, in two years, Roy's, Roy's built out a 13-person team at the company, of which I'm, sorry, I'm one person. Um, and the idea was we would, you know, the company conceded that we didn't have civil rights expertise at the company. Mm -hmm. And so as we began to hire people from outside the company who have the expertise, um, we, we saved one role internally for me. I mean, it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't not for me, but for an internal person to help all of these Bring new together. external people yeah. navigate the company. Yeah. And so that's been my role on the team. But, but the, the, the team is, I think, the biggest achievement coming out of that audit, um, building the team that took some time. Um, but, but then also we have, you know, other structures in place. You mentioned, um, a com like a committee or a task force. We have something similar, I think probably borrowed, um, some, like a lesson <laughs> learned from Airbnb. We have a civil rights task force made up of executives nice. at the company, um, so that people can bubble up issues. Um, and then going back to the 117 recommendations and action items of the 117, we have we have um, implemented or we've listed as implemented and ongoing because some of the work will never be done, like right. you know, engage with experts on AI bias. So 97 of those 117 action items have been implemented or are implemented ongoing, which is wow. incredible. Um, Let's just pause for that. Yeah. yeah. We're, and I think, like Janae was saying, it's it's um, it's not it, it is really cross-functional. That doesn't represent just the work of the civil rights team. Yeah. It represents the work of the company. And so, um, as we've built the civil rights team, we've also tried to encourage other teams to embed civil rights expertise on their teams, especially core teams like the elections teams, different product teams. Um, and then, the last thing I'll say is, you know, Laura's audit. There were 117 like line by line um, recommendations, but she made some very broad overarching comments about about the company and about ensuring that that civil rights remains core to, uh, to Facebook to meta. Yeah. And and those are things that I think we have to keep working on in, on a day to day to day basis. It's like, you know, there, some of it was like, you need to have commitment from the very top, you need to have leader leadership, right. um, commitment from the very top. Um, we need to, we need to, um, I think there's a gap between the way other people think that our policies apply to certain pieces of content and then the way we apply and, and um, apply, apply our policies to different pieces of content. So I think it's, th those kinds of things are, we, we can say we've checked all nine, 97 of 117 boxes, but there is a lot, a lot of room to grow on some of the day-to-day, -day, yep. um, like, ethos. Yeah, I love that. Amazing work, ladies. <laughs> I just want to clap it up for y'all. Just, just some more. Um, so how did you two get into it? I'm, I'm thinking about maybe some aspiring. And Laura, I'd love for you to answer this question too. Any any young folk out there that are watching this right now and are like, what they are doing sounds cool. I, wa I want to do that too. So I would love for you all to share a little bit about you know, how you got into this, what keeps you going, all of that good stuff. But, but maybe like what education want to is needed. Start with the stars. <laughs> let's let's go. Who wants the to stars, start? Janae oh. The stars, Janae and Roosh. The stars. Yes. I, I was going to give it to you, Laura. Um, I, I I will give it to her because Laura is again the reason that I am at Airbnb. Um, so she mentioned our work together in the civil rights space. Um, and I, I shared again with folks last night. So again, this is like a repeat. I'm sorry, everyone. Well, there's folks at yes, home that yes, weren't there are here folks last at home night. And so there are folks in the audience who weren't <laughs> here, but I'm gonna say it again. Um, I, I come out of the advocacy space and the activist space. And so I um, started my career in Medicaid and corporate Medicaid. And there, it was something that just didn't connect for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I transitioned um, to the nonprofit space and was really focused on, you know, the nonprofit advocacy space. Um, and that led me to National Action Network, um, where I served first as the um, DC bureau chief, and I sort of opened up and stood up the legislative advocacy office for the organization, Reverend Al Sharpton, if you're not familiar yes, with am. National Action <laughs> Network. Um, and at that time, Laura was at ACLU, and she kindly took me under her wing and said, like, if you need help with anything, you please let me know. Um, and it began an admiration 
from me to her um, of just who she was, the work that she was doing. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways I was like intimidated. Like she said, oh, you know, let me take you under my wing. And I was like, I don't know if she means big it. Wing. Like I, it's a big <laughs> wing, it, it is. And, and I didn't want to call on her too much, but I, I mean, I have very fond memories of Laura and I in lots of meetings in the White House and with other um, organizations that were similar organizations. and her pulling me to the side afterwards and us having some very great conversations. Um, and I left National Action Network um, after becoming executive director. I left in 2015, at the very end of 2015. And I did not know what I was gonna do. Mm. I just left, cause I needed, like, I needed a mental reset. Um, and I took eight months and was traveling. I happened to go to the DNC convention and I bumped into Laura and she <laughs> put, pulled me over to the corner and she said, <laughs> would you ever consider working for Airbnb? And I said, sure, oh yeah. In the back of my mind though, and, I, and Laura <laughs> right. knows this now, but in the back of my mind, I was like, I don't see myself working sense. in tech. Like mm -hmm. in my mind, I was going to another social justice, civil rights organization, and that was gonna be the, the continuation of my trajectory. Mm -hmm. They started to reach out to me and they talked to me about a role. And at the time, I started planning the Women's March. And so again, in my mind, I'm like, I'm just gonna continue on because I told Laura that I would and she recommended my name. So I'm gonna continue on this process. And through that journey of me learning about Airbnb and learning about the values, learning about the work that they had done with Laura and the commitment that they had made, mm -hmm. I found in a company where I could see my activist self showing up yes. fully and being welcomed. There you go. And yeah. that for me was, a true game changer because it led me on this six year journey. I've never been anywhere in my career longer. Six years, right. Six years, and I mean, to some people that's not a long time. I know that there are people who work 50 years at a company. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm of a generation where that's people switch a lot, right? You know, yeah, we, yeah. We, we move around, we move around. So six years for me, is, it's, it says something. Mm -hmm. um, and in that time, in those six years, my career has grown and shifted and I've, developed other things and core competencies and I oversee um, more things. I oversee our community fund, which again, felt like a full circle moment. So there wasn't exactly a, a linear path. Right. Um, and I think if anyone in the audience or anyone at home is listening and trying to figure out how to get into something like this, um, I think much more now there are opportunities, but also um, take the leaps that don't always make sense. Um, do the thing that scares you. Mm -hmm. um, because in that, you will find growth, you will find opportunity, and I'm, I'm sure that you will find, you know, new passions for your career. I love that. I also want to add, yes, that when someone like Laura offers you oh, their well, wings, yes. Yes. You, you, take, go, you, you take, take, you it. take it. <laughs> you take it. And she continues to be Mm -hmm. An advisor, I, I, uh, an advisor, a mentor, a sister, a friend. Yes. I love her to pieces. She yes. is yeah. amazing. Because yeah. sometimes people can see something in you that you, that can't, you can't see in you yourself. yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. And, I, and she has been that for me. Mm -hmm. She has been that for me I love numerous you. times in my career. So thank you, Laura. I love you. <laughs> I love you back. Aw, love it. Um, Rashika, tell us a little bit about... Yeah, I feel like I was meant to be your real life friend. Um, <laughs> Good, all right. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, my trajectory also wasn't linear. It was circuitous. I floundered for a little bit. So I don't want to suggest that there's some academic background or job you have to have to get to where I am right now. I feel so lucky to have the job that I have. I never could have imagined having this job. I don't think this job this type of job existed when I graduated from first right. undergrad and, and then um, and then law school. I did go to law school, um, but I and I and I was really interested in you know constitutional law as a class that everybody takes in law school. It's a required class. I, I loved the Constitution. I loved mm -hmm. the First Amendment and freedom of speech issues. The cases that we read, both like the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, I took a class. I graduated law school in 2010 and I took a class called Inter the Internet Law, um, and it, as if the internet was a monolith. Um, so it kind of just tells you like what, what things were like in 2010, and how, 2010 wasn't that long ago in my mind. Um, we've evolved so, so yeah. much. And so I was always interested in these issues, 
but I didn't, I didn't know how to, I didn't know what job could come of that. Um, so I graduated from law school and, and I tried very hard to get a job in the civil rights space. I had interned at Human Rights Watch. I had interned at the ACLU in the New York headquarters, um, but nobody would hire me. Um, and so I took a job at a law firm and knew I didn't, that's not what I wanted to do, but I didn't know what else to do. I, I, I lasted for a couple years. And then I quit and bought a one-way ticket to D.C. and had friends there and slept on couches. And I think it was 63 days of sleeping on couches until I got a job. I got a job in communication. So I completely left the law and worked in crisis comms in D.C. And the crisis comms job led me to the job at Facebook. And so the whole time I was in D.C., I was trying to apply to jobs at the intersection of tech and policy because I knew that's what I was interested in. Um, but I could have never imagined w what that would mean in practice. Um, so my first job at, at Facebook, when it was Facebook, was like I was saying on the content policy and communications side, and I supported the audit in that role. I was, um, you know, doing all the internal advocacy as part of a, a team, but also communicating about the audit, which is, which is equally important. People want to hear about what you're doing, and you need to be open and honest and be willing to have hard conversations. Um, and then, and then this, the, you know, because of Laura, this position opened up, and I was able to apply. And I think I had a little bit of a leg up because of Laura. Um, so, yeah, kind of very, very roundabout. I'm happy to talk about it more um, at lunch or if anybody has questions. But I feel very fortunate. I know from the outside, Meta is sometimes, um, you know, not the most just a smidge. Yeah. Yeah, everybody has an opinion. I won't say like good or bad. Everybody has an opinion, but I feel the, the work that we do is so impactful, yeah. and um, you know it, it can it can influence you know millions and billions, billions of people. people. And when you, I, I think Laura might agree to this too. I think one of the really surprising things about coming to the company was um, the people that work there care so very deeply about about what they're working on. It's it's really, really hardworking, um, passionate people. And so I think that's been one of uh, my colleagues are the, one of the best parts of, of my job. Especially when you have a platform that has that many people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or access to that many people. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I actually heard some similarities. So hopefully the folks, y'all, <laughs> y'all heard the sim similarities in these stories. Um, some risk takers <laughs> and folks who are just willing to be led I, I will say, I'm not gonna say by, by who or what. Uh, now, Laura, I know yesterday you and I had a quick chat when we, you called me and then we called Bush, and we was like, Bush, uh, we're hearing a lot of different stories about what's gonna happen today. And I mentioned to you in passing that I wasn't familiar with your work, but now I can say that I've, I have felt, certainly felt your work mm -hmm. and been honored by your work. So tell me, and I know you probably thought, who is this little girl <laughs> on this phone? <laughs> Telling me, no, she held up my work. No, tell me, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to do this work and, and working, end up working with these two. Well, I come from a, a family that's, that started a newspaper, the Afro-American newspaper, 131 years ago in Baltimore, Maryland. And my parents were civil rights activists. So, thank you. And so I, you know, I grew up handing out campaign literature starting at the age of seven. There were 14 runs for public office in my immediate family. And Reverend Jackson came to Baltimore and I'd go to, you know, as a young person, I'd go hear him speak. And then my brother ran for mayor and he endorsed my brother and I went campaigning around the city of Baltimore when he ran for mayor. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a long history and expectation in my family of service. But then this whole corporate pivot came because someone on the, in the civil rights community was a next door neighbor to an executive at Airbnb who was downloading the problems Airbnb was having. And so she said, well, Lauren just left the ACLU. Let me just call her. And I remember uh, getting this call out of the blue from Airbnb, and I'm like, oh, man, 
I don't do corporate, you know, but they <laughs> had an intriguing story. You know, they had an intriguing story and they seemed really genuine that they, you know, this Airbnb while black and Harvard Business School did a study about discrimination on the platform. They were hot to trot. They were in crisis mitigation mode. And so they were ready to roll. And I was doing a fellowship at Harvard and I was in the middle of my fellowship. And I said, this is fascinating to my husband. And he said, are you sure you want to do this here in the middle of a fellowship? I said, well, I can do both. So I just had a meeting with them. One meeting was 45 minutes. The next meeting was two hours. And then, you know, we started contract negotiations. I didn't even know what to charge them for this, right? And so um, it was very... <laughs> <laughs> well, too late now. Sorry. I, <laughs> I did not charge enough. I, I can assure you that. But, um, but, you know, the work was intriguing. And here's the story that I want the listeners to come away with. Corporations have an obligation not to engage in discrimination, yeah, yeah. but their leaders often don't have the tools. So we need civil rights experts to work inside corporations to consult with corporations. And one of the things that I'm, you know, the reason I would chase down Janae and say, are you interested? And, <laughs> and Roosh, and say, Roosh, I'm going to hold you closer because you are <laughs> fabulous. Um, I believe in these women. And I believe in these, in, and, and if I don't help uh, populate this field with the next generation of thinkers and innovators, like Janae and Rushika, I, what am I doing? You know, I don't need, I mean, I could enrich myself. Yeah, that, but that would just help me. My job is to lay the groundwork so that we have a new frontier for civil rights. Because let me just tell you, our laws, our Congress, our government can only do so much. Corporations make up the bulk of our economy. And if corporations are engaging in discrimination, if they're not addressing the problems, then you can't say you're doing a lot for civil rights just by working with the government. Right. You've got to work <laughs> with corporate America. They've got to buy into this. And so I feel like this frontier of civil rights advocacy needs to be deeply expanded because this, is, this represents the concerns of our workforce writ large, of our consumers writ large, if they are facing discrimination, corporations are going to fail, the economy is not going to work well. And so my job is to leave the trail of breadcrumbs and to help find people who want to do this work inside corporate America and as consultants. Woo! Can we just give a clap? I'm almost going to say Laura Murphy, 2024. Anything yeah. else? <laughs> well, just a little bug, a little breadcrumb no. I want to throw your way. Well, no. I wanna, we got to move along with our program. So I want to thank our panelists today, these wonderful women that I've been honored to share the stage with. Keep doing the good work, thank the you. Lord's work. 